I don't know. The Jesus, here's Mary, and she finds herself in this place of brokenness. And she goes to the tomb, goes to the apostles, and she says, yeah, they've, Jesus is gone, and I don't know where he is. Looks at the angels, why are you weeping? I, because he's gone, and I don't know what to do. Just those three words, I don't know. Or four words, I do not know. Like either way, it's just inner brokenness, just I, just, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if you've ever felt like that. You get to this place in life, because that's how life goes, right? That we realize, that all of us recognize that even though we want life to be a cruise ship, life is more often a battleship. That as often as we want uh, life to be a, a picnic right, on the field, it's more like life on a battlefield. Um, that we recognize that there's these things that just hit us and tear us apart. I mean, you get to this place where like, I, I don't know, I do not, I don't know why this is happening. And not only I don't know why this is happening, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I was thinking about, uh, thinking about this because last couple of weeks, I've been really just, it's been on my heart a lot. Like, I think in those moments where I don't know what to do or I don't know what's going on, that we, that's the biggest wound we all can experience. Because in that moment, what we're tempted to do is the number one thing that we shouldn't do. In that moment, what we're tempted to do is we're tempted to hold, bring our hearts back, right? We're tempted to not trust. We're tempted to um, say, okay, I don't know what's going on. This is crazy. This is difficult. This is hard. I'm in pain. And so we draw back. We take our hearts back, especially we take our hearts back from the only one who could hold our hearts. And in the moment of pain, what we do is we say, I won't, I won't trust. In the middle of trouble, I will not trust. When life is filled with trouble, I will not trust. Why? Because I do not know what to do. So a bunch of years ago, I was in Israel, and um, there's this place called Yad Vashem. I don't know if you've ever heard of Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Memorial Museum in, uh, just outside Jerusalem. And so it's, it's an incredibly like, powerful, incredibly um, tragic, incredibly sorrowful, sad place. And so you're walking through this, 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 um, this building that has all these millions of people who have died. And there's some, some of these moments are like, and then there's like, you know, how Christians kind of collaborated sometimes with the Nazis, or how Christians have not always treated our brothers and sisters, the Jews, very well. And so you walk by those, those you know, booths and those signs, and I'm like, oh, okay, yes. <laughs> Cover up the collar. Yeah, no, I don't know who those people are. And at one point, this one 50, like 15-year-old kid comes up to me, and he's like, hey, um, and out of nowhere, like he's from California, he's a Jewish kid, came up to me out of nowhere, and he's like, hey, um, did you know that my, cousin, my dad's cousins died in the Holocaust? And I'm like, uh, no, I don't know your dad. You know, kind of a, this, I'm like, no, oh my gosh, that's terrible, I'm so sorry. And he's like, yeah, um, yeah, they, they got killed in the Holocaust, and, and where's my dad? And he pointed over to his dad, and his dad was like one of the largest men I've ever seen in my life. He was like, he was like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, like this big husky fella, and with this, you know, massive beard. And this, his son goes over and says, Dad, Dad, he wants to know about your cousins who died in the Holocaust. And I'm like, no, I don't. Like, I'm like, what do I? And, and his, dad, his dad was taken aback. He's like, oh, okay. He looks at me and sees the collar and stuff like, just like, like what is the story? What? He's okay, so, uh, yeah, so my... My uh, cousin, I had some cousins, and they were uh, living in Germany. And the, wait, wait, why do you want to know? I'm like, I don't, sir. I have no idea. I'm completely respectful, but I just, no, your son just started talking to me. And then he like, figured out the story. He's like, oh, yeah, I get it. He does that. He just walks up to people and talks. And I say, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. I know this is a, it's a, you know, a sacred place. And so I started walking away. I get like five steps, and all of a sudden I hear this booming voice from this large man. Just He figured out what was going on, and he's like, Hey, stop, get back here right now. And I'm like, no, just keep walking. So I, no, I stopped and I'm like, uh, yes. He said, get over here. I have some questions I want to ask you. Because he just kind of recovered, right? And he figured out that here's a priest, he's a Catholic, he's a Christian. Actually, he asked me, are you a Christian? I said, uh-huh. Um, <laughs> and he was, you know, he, again, he had gathered his wits and he, he said, okay, here's the thing, I don't know. This same, thing, same kind of thing, like in the midst of suffering, in the midst of pain, here's what I've never understood. He looks at me and he said, here's something I've never understood in my life. You say that, you, you're a Christian, you Christians say that us, the Jews, killed Jesus. And you blame us for killing him. And yet you also say that Jesus' death is what saves you. 
So you say that we're the villains because we killed Jesus, but actually, by his death, you have life. So how come we're not the heroes? <laughs> and he was really mad. He was really ramped up. And I was like, okay, Jesus, help me right now. Um, so first I looked and said, well, first, you know, as Christians, as Catholics, we don't actually believe that the Jews killed Jesus. In fact, our theology is that he died for what? He died for my sins. To be able to look at him and say, actually, I, I believe as a Catholic Christian that I killed Jesus. That it was my sins that killed Jesus. In fact, I'm, maybe I'm, a number of you probably have seen the movie The Passion that was made by you know, Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson's the director of this whole, this whole film, and he doesn't, he doesn't show up in, he's not in the movie at all except for one scene. And the one scene that Mel Gibson is in is when Jesus' hands are being nailed to the cross. Those are Mel Gibson's hands holding the nail and driving in, it, driving in through his hands. Because Mel Gibson believes the same thing we believe as Catholics, is that it was my sins that killed Jesus. So first I said, we don't believe the Jew, it was my sins. He's like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, but like, I don't get it. I don't know how you would say this great thing, your salvation, came out of the worst thing. I said, actually, that's exactly what we believe. We believe that the crucifixion of Jesus is the worst thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. I mean, think about this. This is the worst thing that's ever happened in the history. Talk about a, not, I don't want to make light of this, talk about a bad day. But this, isn't, this is not just a bad day for Jesus. This is a bad day for us. Because why? Because here is God who is immutable. He's, he's unstoppable. He's invincible. He is, you cannot hurt God because he's God. What happens? The, from the moment God makes himself vulnerable, what do we start trying to do? We start trying to hurt him. Think about this. From the moment God makes himself vulnerable, we start trying to kill him. He gets born in Bethlehem and Herod says, let's kill everybody because we want to kill him. The parents have to go out and flee to Egypt. Why? Because we want to kill him. When he becomes, enters into his public life, he goes back to Nazareth, and they say, we want to kill you. He goes in Jerusalem. They want to kill him. And then finally, on Good Friday, we actually ended up, we succeeded in killing him. The worst day in the world, not just for God, but for humanity. But out of the worst thing that's ever happened in human history, God brought the best thing that's ever happened in human history. Out of the worst thing, God's death in our worst was shown on Good Friday. But Jesus saves us. So I'm talking to this man who's Jewish, and I said, okay, how about this? How about the story? You know the story of Joseph, right? You guys know the story? You all know the story of J -J -J Joseph? Remember Joseph? He, had, he was like the 10th of, or 11th of all these sons. He, he had this like amazing Technicolor dream coat. And um, at one point, his brothers sold him into slavery. Now think about this. You might have some sibling rivalry, but <laughs> your experience with your siblings, they've never, A, a tried to kill you, and then the good brother says, um, no, let's not kill him. Let's sell him into slavery. <laughs> That'll be way better. Like, as bad as your family might be, you probably haven't done that yet. So Joseph gets sold into slavery. And I mean, think about Joseph's life. At any moment in Joseph's life, he could be like Mary says, I have no idea. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening right now. He gets sold into slavery and actually does a pretty good job. He's an honest person. He's took, he, he continues to honor God, even in the midst of being a slave to Potiphar, this guy. But at one point, Potiphar's wife tries to you know, make advances, make the moves with Joseph, and Joseph's like, no, I want to honor your master, and I honor God, so I'm not going to do this. As a reward, he gets thrown into jail. Now, if that was me, I'd be like, yep, typical. Thanks a lot, God. Like, how many times do we have that kind of experience where you try to do something good, and like, it goes all wrong, and you're like, oh, typical. Thanks a lot, God. Or you get on the bus to go to Steubenville, and something bad happens, and like, typical. I try to serve God, and I don't get my juice box. Like, whatever that thing is. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, he goes to jail. And God's still with him. That's the crazy thing. God is still with Joseph in jail, and he's able to interpret some people's dreams. And he says, okay, Here's your dreams. God's interpreting your dreams. But remember me when you go to talk to Pharaoh. And what happens? The guy who gets out of jail forgets to talk to Pharaoh about him. Typical figures, my life and everything. Like, I don't, that, Joseph, it'd be so easy for Joseph to say, I don't know what's happening. But then, as God is involved in all of this, Joseph doesn't say that. Joseph's just, I'm going to be faithful. And it ends up that Joseph becomes number two in the entire kingdom of Egypt. And because Joseph allowed himself to not just say, I don't know, therefore I'm going to hold my heart back. I don't know what's going on, therefore I'm going to pull back. I don't know, so I'm not going to be faithful to God because it doesn't seem like he's faithful to me. 
Because of that, Joseph was able not only to save the entire kingdom of Egypt, he was also to save his entire family from famine, from starvation. And at the end of the book, his brothers come to him and say, you're going to kill us now because you must want to take vengeance on us. And Joseph says, no, 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 listen, I didn't know why God did this. Like Mary Magdalene, I didn't know why God did this all. But he took your evil thing and he brought great good out of it. He took the evil that you wanted to do and he brought great good out of it. And so I talked to this man in Yad Vashem and said, like Joseph, you know, Joseph, that was a terrible thing. That God took something evil that was done to this man and he saved the entire people of Israel by that action. I said, that's exactly what happens on the cross. And this man looks and says, well, that makes sense. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. <laughs> and that was basically it. But it just kept coming back to me. That, you know, the whole Bible is all about this. The, almost every story in Scripture has someone in a moment where they're like, I don't know. I don't know what's happening right now. And again, if you find yourself in that kind of moment, you're not alone. You're just another person in God's story. You're, you're a person that God's saying, listen, Please, in that moment when you don't know, please still hold on to me. In that moment where you don't know, would you please not take your heart back, but give your, move your heart forward. In fact, there's another story, the last, second to last story I want to share with you guys today. Um, there's a story in the book of Daniel. You know, a terrible thing happens, right? People of Israel, they all get exiled. They get exiled up to Babylon. And there's these three guys. Their names are um, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. They get, they get chosen out of all the young men from Israel who are now in some other foreign land to, like, to serve King Nebuchadnezzar. So like, okay, well, here we are, and we're going to try to be faithful to God. I don't know what's happening. I don't know why God is allowing King Nebuchadnezzar to destroy our people, but we're going to be faithful. I don't know what's going on. We'll be faithful. At one point, King Nebuchadnezzar erects this huge statue of himself. He says, whenever you hear the cymbals, whenever you hear the trumpet, whenever you hear the horns, everyone in the kingdom is supposed to bow down to my statue. But Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, they said, well, we belong to the Lord God, so we can't do that. So the cymbals go off, the horns go off, everyone's kneeling, except these three guys, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, are like, yeah, no. And so it's, I love how Scripture describes this. This is in uh, Daniel chapter 3. It's King Nebuchadnezzar. He kind of had an ego problem, and he like flew into a rage, it says this. It says he, he flew into a rage in the, verse 13. And he questioned them, is it true, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, that you will stir, not serve my God or worship the golden statue I set up? You will do this, he says. You will do this. Or you shall be instantly cast into the white-hot furnace. Apparently they had this massive furnace that they had stoked so hot that it was white-hot. It wasn't just red-hot, it wasn't blue-hot, it was white-hot. I will burn you alive, he says. I will burn you alive unless you bow down before the statue I erected and abandon your God. And then he asks the question, and who is the God who will be able to deliver you out of my hands? Here is Nebuchadnezzar who has all the power, and Hananiah, Ezra, and Mishael have no power. You can imagine that moment, they're going like, well, I just, uh, I don't know. Why? Because life has not turned out how I expected I thought I was going to be faithful to God, and I thought he would respond with just, like, blessings. And who is the God who can deliver you out of my hands? But this is where things get super intense. This is when Shadrach, or Hananiah, Azra, and Mishael, they look back at the king, and I love this, because these are just people who are, they're slaves, basically, and they're talking to the most powerful person in the world, and they say this, there's no need for us to defend ourselves before you in this matter. I'm like, oh, Really? No, we don't have to defend ourselves before you. Like, yeah, you do. He's the king. He's going to kill you in a second. We don't have to explain ourselves to you. Here's the line. If our God, whom we serve, can save us, he'll save us. If the God whom we serve can save us from the white-hot furnace and from your hands, O king, may he save us. The next line is the line that kills me. But even if he will not, know, O king, that we will not serve your God 
or worship the golden statue you set up. Think about this. In this moment where everything is falling apart, in this moment where they're standing in front of their very death, and they say, we don't have to explain ourselves to you. If our God, if our God, if our God can save us, may he save us. But even if he doesn't, he's still our God. But even if he will not, we will still trust him. See, this is the key. Because every single one of us will get to this place that Mary Magdalene was at. We're like, I don't know what's... Why, when I gave everything to Jesus, is everything taken away? Hanani, Azariah, Mishael. How? Why? When I trusted in Yahweh, our God, is now I'm standing in front of the furnace. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do right now. Here's what's going to happen in your life. I'm telling you guys, I don't know if you've already had this. It's what's going to happen in your life. You are going to get to this place where everything will drop out, where your friends will have left, where the people that you've loved will have left, or they'll be taken away, where everything you hoped for is going to seem like it's being stripped away from you, like Mary Magdalene, that everything she trusted in is now gone. I I hate to say that. That's just what's going to happen. And in that moment... Say, I don't know what to do now. I don't, I don't know. Scripture tells us exactly what to do. Hananiah, Misarai, Misarai, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ananiah stand in front of the king. If our God can save us, may he save us. But even if he will not, we will praise him. And then what happens is they get thrown into the fire. And in the fire, what do they do? In the fire, it says, they prayed aloud. Blessed are you and praiseworthy, O Lord, our God of our fathers. Blessed is your name. Holy is your name. What they do, I don't know what to do. In the midst of trouble, here's what you do in the midst of trouble. Praise God. Here's what, here's what we are tempted to do. I'm tempted to hold my heart back. In trouble, I want, don't want to trust. But here's the thing. Scripture tells us, in the midst of trouble, the answer is praise him. In the midst of trouble, the answer is, and yet I will praise him. Another guy, I don't need to confuse you with all these names, Habakkuk. He was in the same position as Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. He was stripped from his home, stripped from his family, and everything was gone. In the very last lines in his book of Habakkuk, he says, all, everything else is gone, and yet, and yet, I will praise the Lord. There will come a day, very soon, when you'll go to pray and you won't feel anything. You go to pray and you say, like, all the things that I, I, I thought I gave my heart to Jesus at Steubenville and I went back home and I don't feel anything anymore. What do I do then? I don't know. Yes, you do. I will praise him. This is the last thing. Back in uh, 1871, there was this man named Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford lived in Chicago, um, Illinois, and he had a wife he loved and he had five kids. He had four girls and a little boy. And Horatio and his wife, they loved Jesus. They were Christians, loved Jesus. And at one point, though, his little boy got sick. And in the middle of the night, one night, in the middle of the night, his son, his little boy just died. It's taken away one night. And you think that that would be, that would be, that'd be enough for someone to just be broken, but that's not... Then what happened was in 1871, there was the great fire in Chicago. And Rachel Spafford lost everything. His whole business was destroyed. He had no money left. You think at that point he'd say, like, listen, I, I'm out. I don't know what to do now. I'm out. But he didn't. He was like, no, I belong to Jesus. To recover, he said, okay, I'm going to send. He, they're gonna, his family's going to move to Europe. They said, well, if we need a new start, we're going to leave America, leave Chicago, we're going to Europe, we have a fresh start. We're going to, over, in, over in Europe, we're going to, we're going to start new, we're going to have a new life out there. And so he had some business to happen, to, to, to wrap up in Chicago. So he sent his wife and his four remaining girls on an ocean liner across the Atlantic. But in 1873, in the middle of the North Atlantic, that boat hit another boat and it sank. The next morning in the middle of the North Atlantic, all they found was his wife holding on to this life raft, the only one who survived from his family. She gets to Europe. She telegraphs him. She says, 
These words, saved alone. What shall I do now? You can imagine this guy. His little boy is dead. He's lost everything. And now his four little girls, his four girls have been taken away from him. So he tells his wife, stay there, I'm coming to you. And he gets on a ship and he begins sailing across the Atlantic. The captain knew Horatio's story and so in the middle of the night, they, they were crossing over the exact spot where his four girls were killed. And the captain sent word to Horatio, come up to the, come up to the cockpit, come up here. This is the spot. And he actually stalled the ship. Because I know you lost your four girls. You'd think in that place, in that moment, in that night, Horatio would say, I don't know. I don't know that I can trust God. I don't know that I can praise him. I don't know that I can give it my heart. I lost everything. But he goes back down to his cabin and he sits down and he writes this song that when the waves come against me, when ocean threatens to overwhelm me, and when everything has attacked me and stripped me of everything I love, my heart says it's well. My heart says it is well. That when I don't know what to do, because it's all gone, what I will say is I won't take my heart back. I will give praise. I won't take my heart back. I will give worship. And I will say it is well. It is, it is well with my soul. You guys, I don't know where you are. Like, I don't know if you're in the middle of that, that moment where God's taking stuff or where someone else is taking stuff. And you don't know what to do, but I do know what you need to do. We need to praise. That's the answer. I don't know what to do. You need to praise. So we're going to pray right now. Right wherever you're sitting, just stay sitting. And we're going to praise God in the midst of trouble. We're going to praise God in the midst of a storm. We're going to praise God when I do not know what's going on. I'll say it is well. It is well. Thank you.